Hello, it's James from xrobots.co.uk. This is part 14 of building a real working Iron Man inspired exosuit that makes me really strong. Uh, we've basically built version 1 and it moves when I move, I can walk along in it. It also actually supports my own weight as well as its own weight. And last time I put this hand controller in so that the arm moves uh, just about when I move and we're using force sensitive resistors, the results aren't great. But on the whole, we've got um, a proof of concept that shows that this thing can be made. It's self-supporting um, and all the joints work. And early on, we did some development on the brushless motors and gearboxes and the arm should be able to lift quite a lot of weight. But I think I can build something better. So last time we talked about making it a bit more sleek, a bit more Iron Man and less aliens power loader. And we're going to work through that design in this episode. But which bits are good and which bits are bad? So I was pretty happy with my 3D printed gearboxes and these have brushless motors, some nylon gears and then these blocks and tackles that you can see which basically means the load is spread over multiple cheaper parts and they're really powerful. These are 3674 brushless in-runner motors which don't cost very much and I'm using normal Hobby King ESCs to drive them and they seem to have enough power to power these gearboxes through two gear stages and move the joints with those blocks and tackles. There are more of those on the legs doing exactly the same thing, but I think these could probably be quite a lot smaller. I could probably make these gears half the size. There's also quite a lot of wasted space in their width there, mainly because this pulley is wide and originally there was another gear stage, but we could probably make that half the size. And if we made the gears half the size again, we could probably get this down to a quarter of the size it is now. I'm not really unhappy with the whole leg design. It is a bit wide and bulky and obviously it's all strung up with bungees and bits of string and there's wires and things everywhere. This is actually quite wide, it's about 400 mil. Uh, we really need to make that much smaller and fit around my legs better. On the whole though I'm quite happy, we've got end stops and we've got this locking thing that means the leg is locked and you can put load on the top but I can still move in it. So we're going to keep some of those principles, but make it a bit more sleek and make it a bit more Iron Man-like. The arm itself, of course, has grown organically during the project. We're originally just going to build a one power arm on a backpack, but of course, as it got heavier, we needed to make legs to support it. Um, there's lots of joints here. We've got four axes, including the elbow, but now, of course, the suit is really lopsided and really heavy on one side. There isn't space to build another arm on the other side because one of the axes takes up most of the back here, but the plan is going to be to build some much lighter weight arms and to build a pair of them on the new suit. So we want to make the whole thing much more streamlined and something that's actually locked into my hips so that it moves when I move instead of me having to hold onto these handles and I can keep my hands actually in the arms. And we're going to need to do some more investigation into pressure switches as we go. We haven't had too much luck with normal switches and force sensitive resistors so far. But let's have a look at the design and some of the materials that we could use. So I decided to lay out the knee, hip and ankle joints and get the spacing right. And I'm going to try and make a thing which basically uses cables or rods to keep them parallel. So it's like the parallelogram, but it's all based around hubs. Um, so I started laying out the joints and uh, the uh, ankle, of course, is at the bottom. And you'll notice the shin is slightly shorter than the thigh joint there. And then I realised I couldn't quite get my head around it being a parallelogram with cables or linkages on the outsides of these and which bits stay parallel and which bits don't and where the motor would drive against them. So I decided to make a tiny version which is scaled down to a small model there with some rods that fit and we're going to print that one off and then look at the model and see how it works. And here it is. So uh, basically we've got several layers here. We've got the main sticks and we've got several hubs that turn independently from them. The bottom one of course is the ankle, the middle one is that kind of knee parallel part we've got at the moment and the top would be the hip. So um, it looks pretty much like the two parallelograms if we look at the red bars and those screw holes. Um, and of course, if we were to uh, try and move the bottom there, it stays parallel with the knee and the same there at the top. So um, that seems to be very similar to what we've got now. Only my leg would be in the middle and it would look a bit more like a leg rather than a kind of box made of wood. So the place to put the motors, of course, is on the sticks driving against their hubs. So if we were to have a motor on the bottom, uh, which pulled the blocks and tackles behind these bars then that would pull the foot around and that would pull the bottom of the leg and similarly if we do that at the top as well so the hip would be still and that motor would pull up and down around this that would pull the uh, top of the leg around so there we could put two motors in the legs at the moment we only have one of course and the bottom is passive but this seems to be the right sort of design to go forward with. And of course we can take one set of links away and we still uh, keep that parallel action because of course we've still got the middle bar and one of these. However, if we were to do it that way, then the red bar has to be strong enough. It doesn't bend 
um, otherwise it won't maintain its parallel nature and it won't be strong enough to support the load on top of it. So if the red bars were really thin, they could be really thin studding with tensioners, then a pair of them would work well, or they could even just be steel cables. Before we move on too much with the design, we need to decide what basically most of the materials are, like the sticks for the legs, so that we can design how they're attached to the hubs and how it all hangs together. So in this design, obviously, we've used an awful lot of wood, which is painted silver. There is some aluminium extrusion here. We've got lots of 3D prints. We've got metal brackets, and we've also got some steel tubing. Here are some pieces of plywood. This is hardwood plywood. It's 18 mil, and that's basically going to be what I make most of of the sort of flat sections out of probably the hubs and so on. Plywood is stronger than steel, pound for a pound, and it's obviously really lightweight. Uh, quite a lot of engineering goes into plywood in terms of its bonding and lamination, so it's a really good material, we can paint it and so on. There will obviously be 3D prints and things screwed to it, we're gonna hopefully have some nice contours, but that's gonna be my kind of like, when I need to make a custom shape and it's not 3D printed, that's what I'm going to use. And we can sandwich, of course, some sticks between there and bolt it through and make something pretty strong. And we're not gonna use metal for those parts because they'll end up massively heavy, whether they're even aluminium or steel. For the actual sticks and most of the structure, of course, we could use a piece of wood again. This is just some softwood painted silver like the rest of the suit. It was okay for prototyping. It's pretty light, it's pretty rigid. But of course, um, it'll split and it's not as strong as it could be. And also you can tell the suit is made from wood. So how about some steel tubing? Of course, I can sandwich the uh, square box section between the plywood and bolt it through and that'll make something really rigid. It won't really twist. The uh, tube will twist even less. This is actually stainless tube. We can get some cheaper mild steel though. Although the tube is actually quite hard to secure um, without putting a bolt through and things and any slight rotation will mean that part will twist really easily. Obviously the square one we can sandwich and bolt up and there shouldn't be any twist there. Steel is quite heavy though, although for small sections like this there'd probably be two in each leg section sort of running parallel that wouldn't actually be that heavy. The other option, of course, is aluminium tubing. So I've now got a square piece of aluminium here, uh, which is the same size as the steel. It is um, quite a bit lighter, but it's still metal, so it's not magic. It still does have some weight to it. Um, certainly big chunks of machined aluminium parts have quite a lot of weight to them. So uh, it's not that much of a magic space age material. It's also softer, so um, this will actually twist if I were to grab one end and um, twist it, whereas the steel will twist far less. So there are some advantages um, in terms of its weight, but actually the steel will still be more rigid. Aluminium, of course, comes in different shapes. So we've got some extrusions here, uh, like the stuff I used in the Robot X project. So it's got this slot in it. You put T-nuts in and you can screw plates and things on. So you can actually make the whole thing reconfigurable. Um, this is pretty much the same weight as this, maybe slightly heavier because it's slightly denser, but you can also get some extrusion which is sort of double the width. So this is 2020, you can get 2040, 2060, 2080, where it's all fixed together in one piece. It's got all the slots, but basically it's four times as wide or whatever. So that actually be a really good option so that it would allow the suit to be reconfigurable. If I've got pressure sensors and so on, they can slide up and down and we can adjust the joints a little bit. Now, interestingly enough, one piece of aluminium extrusion weighs roughly the same for the same length length as the piece of wood. So uh, basically we're only doubling the weight from the wood structure to have um, a piece of aluminium that's 2040. So I am quite tempted by the steel box section. Essentially one piece like this that's a meter is enough for one leg. So each one will be two of those. So that's not that heavy. We probably end up with sort of 2040 extrusion in each leg. So comparatively, there's not much in it. The advantage, of course, of the extrusion, it's got the slots in so we could reconfigure sensors and place other bits and pieces. Although there's nothing to stop us just screwing into this or making a clamp that goes round it. But for now, I'm gonna design for roughly that size sandwich between bits of plywood. So at full scale, that stick is in fact 100 mil wide. So it'd probably be more like 2080 extrusion, or we could have two bits of steel box section spaced apart. So thinking through that design a little bit more, I've put in some 20 mil box section sticks, and also all of these flat sections are 18 mil wide. We could go down to 12 mil ply, um, but the leg's not too wide there. So everything is double cross braced, and that's what these sticks are on the outside. So they would have independent hubs. Our red parts are the hip, knee, and ankle, which are the parts that rotate independently and then our blue parts here are the bottom of the leg and the green part is the top of the leg which is all bonded together so um 
The only parts that actually need to be round, of course, are the, the bottom here, which is the bottom pulley and the top pulley. But it's rather nice to have all of those concentric, so they all turn against each other, and we haven't got any funny shapes. But of course they don't really need to be round, so this green piece could have extra uh, piece where it bonds onto the cross section, uh, which is probably something that I'll work into it. It could be skinnier as well, so we could m make that down to 12mm ply, and um, it could be a bit more low profile. And of course the uh, foot needs attaching to those two red plates, so there's something stationary by my ankle and then the same with the two red plates at the hip those are attached together to the rest of the assembly and the knee moves with my knee and that's what's resting on my knee and that's fine because that's the bottom of my leg moving so working a bit further forward I've uh, put those tie bars in which are the red parts that will be on my 3d printed model I've obviously made some feet here to uh, hold it up I'm not sure how wide they need to be they might need to be slightly bigger front to back but they can be any style really and of course I've got two legs and I've now got the back which is um, a very similar assembly you'll notice with those upright tubes and the pivot running this way uh, that's very similar to what we've got now with that backboard um, what's going to be different of course is the arms which are going to hang down from the top and um, they should hang right down over my actual arms instead of being massively back heavy behind me and that looks something like this so I'm not sure if the proportions are correct in terms of my height but obviously they need to come over my shoulders and hang approximately um, front to back at least the same place that my actual shoulders are maybe even slightly further forward uh, so we keep that mass forward instead of having it back off to one side like it was before which was a bit of a nightmare so I'm not sure in fact if uh, where my back is is the right place compared to my hips we'll have to um, put that together when I actually come to build it we also need to put the piece in that actually centers it in the middle so on the other suit I had some sticks that stuck out in the middle from each hip there and they were sprung in a big bungee box which made the thing stand up straight on its own so that still needs putting in but those details I'll work out when I've got it in real life and I can compare it to the size of my own body but that's pretty much the kind of thing I'm thinking of. So I've just wired the thing to the analog in of an Arduino Mega that's sat over there it's just wired to the analog pin and obviously 5 volts and ground and in my code we've just got uh, reading the analog and chucking it straight out to the serial terminal with a little delay so if we now have a look at the serial monitor we can see some values there it's pretty hard to see what's going on though the values are a bit noisy so we're going to use the serial plotter instead which plots a lovely graph so you can see we've got values there that range between about 180 and somewhere about 250 something like that even though there's noise it's um you know within a threshold we can decide so uh, basically if I grab this and it's very fiddly so I'm gonna have to grab the base here and then try and bend the end and you should be to see actually that we get quite a discernible rise in value there the more I bend it and if I bend it the other way it goes all the way back down again it seems to uh, stop at zero so I guess I'd attach a uh, flexible thing to it that would get bent and as I bend it even quite minutely um, we can see the value does change there and it seems quite linear so it does actually seem the more I bend it the higher a value I get which is a difference of the force sensitive resistor so this could be quite good it just, could just be attached to a flexible plate that I push with my knee or whatever and uh, hopefully we get a good range of values it is of course extremely fiddly though as you can see I'm pretty worried I'm going to break it so that's one solution that's probably viable, but let's see what else we've got. The next thing to test is a Hall effect sensor, and that's actually what's in this joystick. So um, the component itself is this tiny thing here, we'll have a closer look at it in a minute, but basically it reacts to a magnet. So what's in here is three Hall effect sensors for the three axis, and essentially the rotation is just a magnet rotating on each axis, and the Hall effect sensor is near, and that gives pretty strong, stable, and reliable results. So let's have a closer look at the thing itself. Okay, so here it is. So it looks like a little transistor, but it's in a special package. And basically, again, it's got five volts and ground and an analog out that's wired to exactly the same pin on the Arduino, and I'm using exactly the same code. And I've got my plotter open already, you can see there. So uh, that value you'll notice from the scale on the side is um, pretty solid, actually, around five, three, seven and a half. It might be varying by 0.1 or something like that because uh, obviously 540 is there and 535 is there, so it's pretty rock solid in fact. Um, and the only magnet I can find is on the back of this uh, lamp. So as I um, come and get this and bring it further or closer away to a magnet, we can see already there we get um, quite a good linear response, and that value goes from about 600 down to 200 as I bring that closer. So you can see I can quite accurately there 
draw a wiggly line. It's a bit like using an etcher sketch or something. So it's actually very linear. And the result is pretty stable. It's, um, there's hardly any noise like there was with that strain gauge. And I can quite accurately draw the line. So I could have basically, again, a, a bendy piece of material or something on a hinge buffered with foam, a magnet at one side, the Hall effect sensor attached to it, glued on and bonded on really well. And I could accurately determine how hard I'm pushing or at least the position of that uh, thing that I push with my knee or I push with my arm. So this actually seems like, um, at the moment, my favourite way to make a pressure pad. I'm really happy with the response we get from that Hall effect sensor, so I think that's going to be the way forward. They're pretty cheap and so are magnets, so that means we have no problem making multiple pads all around the suit, in the arms, in the legs, probably around the shin to tell which way my leg is tilting. We can also put one under the foot to see if I'm lifting my foot up, one above the foot, and also one facing down on the bottom to actually tell whether I've lifted my leg off the ground and to work out how that leg should respond. Obviously in the arms, we could have them in the shoulders perhaps as well to actually help with those axes of moving the arms backwards and forwards. So that's going to be much better than a joystick and a shift button to swap over axis or something like that that we did when we were testing version one. So next time I'm actually going to get to it, I'm going to try and make it as slim lined as possible. So I'm going to try and get some thinner box section steel, perhaps 10 mil thick by 20 mil wide. So we can really skinny down those legs, but still make a really strong structure. So don't forget to subscribe to check back for next time to see it actually being built. And also it's really important to say that all my projects are funded through Patreon. So have a look at patreon.com slash xrobots and you can get access to some exclusive rewards, including a live broadcast with me all my videos early, and also sneak peeks and pics almost every day. All right, that's all for now.